Good afternoon. Um, my name is Laura. I work in London at a private language school called SGI, or St. George International. And I've learned a few things from teaching there, especially because my classes change every week about teaching pronunciation with very little preparation time. So yes, as I was saying, we have some new students come every Monday and some students leave every Friday, which makes it very difficult to prepare what pronunciation I'll teach. But we also have course books, which doesn't always fit very well with that system either. So I've kind of learned a few things and invented a few things about integrating pronunciation work. You can take a handout. Yeah. With um, a course book based syllabus to try and make it as appropriate as possible to the students I have at any given moment without needing a lot of time to prepare. So what I'm going to do in this workshop is take you through some different activities that I find are quite flexible. Um, I've used them for various different pronunciation points with various different students with various different problems. And I just find they're a nice way of making the most of what's in the book, even if the book doesn't have something that's very appropriate for my students, or if I don't have time to prepare what is in the book or adapt it. Um, so there are five things I'm going to show you in total, and we're going to do some examples together, so be prepared to work with the person next to you. If you don't want to, that's fine. So you can think through it in your head. But I find with things like this, sometimes it's helpful to feel, feel your way through the activity the way the students would. So I will give you the opportunity if you want to take it. Hello. This was like a handout. So, the first thing I find it's useful to do when I have a new group is a needs analysis. And as I say, I have some new students every Monday, so I've kind of created this quite elaborate way of doing this that can help me find out what their pronunciation needs are. So it becomes a lesson in itself, and it involves a little bit of the different skills, and it involves everybody speaking, so it helps me get to know my new class very quickly. Um, what I do is I take um, some sentences from the book and do student-student dictation. Now, when I say the word dictation to the students, they all panic and look like they're going to leave immediately. But if I explain that it's not the traditional teacher-led dictation, but they're going to help each other, and they're all starting at the same point, usually they say, oh, okay, and by the end of the lesson, they've got quite a lot out of it. And I don't know if I say enjoyed it, but they've engaged with it, and I learn a lot about what they need that helps inform the rest of the week. But I use what's in the book, so I don't have to create some special task for this. And I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, I give them time to prepare, so they don't feel too put on the spot. They're allowed to look at the sentence they have. It's only a short sentence. They can break it into chunks. They can make notes on any difficult words. Can you take a hand out? And they can ask me if there's any words that they have no idea about. And I tell them beforehand that they'll be allowed to read each sentence twice. And if it is a dictation, it's not a text. So they should be helping each other, but not too much. Then I collect the papers that they've used, and I analyze them, and I give them some feedback on both their productive abilities, so how they pronounced everything, and their receptive abilities, so how they understood the others. And I find that I learn as much about their pronunciation from this as they do, because sometimes my expectations, just from watching them, of what I think they need, are completely different to what's revealed in this activity. This is an example of um, an exercise from New Total English that I used two weeks ago with an upper intermediate group to do this. So each student had one of these sentences. They checked some unknown words. I didn't tell them the topic, so they had to rely just on the sound of the other student's speech, not the context. So focusing really on pronunciation and not on general listening, not on context. And I gave each student a grid to fill in like this. I've erased their names. But here, they wrote the name of each student as they read their sentence, and here they wrote the sentence. So afterwards, I had a copy from each student of what they'd heard. And I also had my notes that I kept, which looked like this, as they were speaking. So completely cryptic to the students, but helpful for me. So as they each read their sentence, I took some notes, and then I compared it with 
what they'd produced so I could work out where their problems were, when they were hearing things unusually, or when they were pronouncing things that caused problems for others in a particular way they were pronouncing it, or if they were pronouncing something in a way that I thought was problematic, but actually it turned out that everybody understood fine. So I learned a lot about their real needs. And then on that basis, I was able to use some of the activities which I'm going to show you to focus on specific sounds in specific areas. So the first one I'm going to show you I call Sound Hunt. It's exactly what it sounds like. The students basically mine a text for examples of a sound. They hunt through the text. And of course the sound is whatever sound I've decided they need based on my needs analysis. It could be anything. It could be a consonant, a vowel, it could be two similar sounds which contrast. And using what's in the book, I identify something that occurs frequently and then their task is to hunt for it, to find it. And then they notice spellings which are typically associated with those sounds, which is one area that i found they really struggle with when they're trying to predict how to pronounce new words, because they've never really paid attention to patterns. And then I get them to think of more examples if they can. So if they're quite strong and feeling confident, they're looking for the A sound, for example, and they found two different spellings associated with it in the text, I try and get them to think of more, just to extend what they already know and to push the stronger students a bit further. So as an example, the two vowels, I and E, a lot of my students, my students, my students struggle with that. Regardless of their background, a lot of them, their first language doesn't have that contrast. And this could be appropriate for any level, and there's an activity, the first one, where it says activity two, sound hunt. That extract there is from New English File Elementary, and I'm going to give you a minute to be the students. Can you underline in this box every word that you can find that has an if? sound, and circle everyone that has an E. So to give you an easy one to start with, inside there's an E. Okay, so if you underline all the E's and circle all the E's, and I'll give you a minute to think about it. Okay, if you're not doing it already, in true TEFL fashion, can you compare with someone next to you and see if you agree? Mine are wrong. If you want to. I have long uh, All right. I'm, I'm not sure if it's short. I think it's short. Short, short. Long. Even long, yeah. I didn't finish this bit. But, uh, people, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have the same, I'm not sure about this, but I think it's short, but then, question mark. <laughs> Factory. Factory. It's my weakest. Oh, right. <laughs> I will see. <laughs> people agree. I won't go through all the answers of every task, some are debatable, but that's kind of the point. You should have found I short vowels in words like in and with, um, office, and ease. The easy ones are evening, people. 
And then the slightly gray areas, which people tend to disagree with, students and teachers, are at the end of factory. Mm -hmm. And in the afternoon or the evening, is it the, is it the? And one of the things that I like best about this activity is it doesn't have to necessarily have a right answer, but it just opens a discussion for how to say things based on how they look. And a lot of students I find either don't ask, they just spend years guessing, or they never really have that dialogue where they talk about what sound is right, or if the teacher even has one strict right answer, or is it different in different accents. So it just opens some space to discuss the sounds, and I think encourages them to notice what's already in the texts in their book. This is not a pronunciation exercise, and there was no pronunciation on this page related to this. And if there is pronunciation on the page in this kind of activity, I often find it's not relevant to my students. Mm -hmm. So if I do the exercise, it's for the sake of doing some pronunciation, but what's the point when I found out that my students need help contrasting those vowels? And there's an example in the book which is really easy to do, and I don't need to do any photocopying or any extra prep or anything like that. I just need to use my own awareness to find the sounds and make sure that they will find these sounds. So that's just one example. The next activity is somewhat similar. Um, and I call it Find Something in Common, which again is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you can come in, but we don't have any handouts left. I'm sorry. So sit near someone. Uh, it's similar to activity two, as I said. And the students search for words or phrases which all have a particular sound or a particular stress pattern or a particular anything. It could be the reverse of what we just did. So what they could do is look for sounds which all, uh, sorry, words which all have the same spelling but actually have different sounds. So again, just prompting them to notice what's in front of them, which I think they often overlook, especially if it's written. They don't think that's relevant to sound and pronunciation, but they can use that to develop their other skills. Um, the other thing is when they found these words or phrases, you can write each one on a slip of paper for a future lesson, maybe to start the next lesson. If they found five examples of I and five examples of E, for example, the next lesson I could give them these papers and they can put them in groups again and see what they remember. So I just found it's a nice way to recycle and doesn't require a lot of extra preparation from me. Um, so the example we're going to do, I want you to find words or phrases with three syllables and the second one stressed, where it says activity three, this gray box. Okay, so can you find all words or phrases which share that stress pattern? Da, da, da. And I'll give you a minute to think. Say it in here. And again, if you're not doing it already, can you compare and see if you agree? 
if you want to. On the whole. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something important to be said about that. So we have collection, discover, on order. I think this one is, isn't it? On order, on order, maybe. Ah, it's a first. In place. Consumers, yes. <laughs> Maybe expense. Oh, expense. Yeah. I don't know. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Identical. I also don't know. Identical. It's for sale. It's for sale. Okay. En route. En route. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> On the whole, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's the end. Yeah. 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 The answers, according to me, and I stress that, of course, sometimes people disagree on these things, but I, I'd like to know in a moment if you agree with me, are connection, right. consumers, yeah. on order, right. and, and discover, thank you. Yeah, so one more, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you probably noticed in doing this, and I've heard some of you saying them out loud, and again, that's what the students will do or should do, and it just helps them put together the different aspects of their knowledge, what they see, what they know, how it sounds, how it feels to say it, and so on. And there are distractors in here, which the course book writers conveniently inserted for me. Um, excellent, three syllables but different stress. On the whole, three syllables but different stress, and so on. And I don't know, if you, if you don't recognize this, there's a source here. This has come from an FCE course book. And I find that exam course books especially rarely have pronunciation work. And where they do, I just find it's often not suitable for my students. The gentleman at the back mentioned phrases. Maybe I should have emphasized that. But again, drawing students' attention to the fact that pronunciation exists at different levels, at sounds, at words, at phrases, at sentences, and that you can have one word or one phrase which share a stress pattern. And this is just in the book, waiting there to be discovered. And normally, when I started teaching FCE a few years ago, we would do this activity. They all hated it. We would spend 30 minutes discussing why one answer was better slightly than one other answer and the other two were completely wrong. And then we would all be so depressed we'd change and do something else. Whereas we could have said, well, let's look at this again but for something different. Instead of looking at the lexis or the grammar, let's look at how it sounds and how you would use it and just exploit it more. Another thing with my exam students is they often ask for more exercises, more practice. Give me more homework. I want to do another multiple choice close. I don't know why. But they can do more with this same text just by using it how it is for pronunciation, which often just gets dismissed. So instead of me photocopying workbooks illegally and giving them lots of extra copies of multiple choice closes, I can just give them a different task, this time that focuses on pronunciation instead of on the lexical grammar. Which brings me to, oh, this is my favorite activity. So this one I call which is which, because it's based on discrimination. Uh, the example on the handout doesn't really show you how this works, but I'm going to show you up here. So the idea is that it works for any pairs of anything which are similar in sound, and which your students have trouble discriminating. So anything which occurs in a pair. And the reason this is my favorite activity is because this is the kind of thing that I find just comes up in a lesson. And no matter how thoroughly I've planned, 
I couldn't anticipate that they were going to confuse these two things. I just didn't see it coming. Especially because in my context, I have um, multilingual classrooms, and I don't speak all the first languages of all the students, and sometimes they surprise me with what they struggle with. And something will happen in a lesson, in the middle of a task, they're, they're supposed to be talking about, I don't know, the weather or something, and two words come up, which they cannot distinguish between, they really struggle with. And I can't have planned for that, because I have no idea. And there's nothing in the book. And it's not going to be a 15-minute lesson stage. It just needs to be some quick attention to this problem. And this is the easiest thing in the world to do. When you see it happen, you write them on opposite sides of the whiteboard. Easy enough. And then you model both. And then you say one or the other at random. And their job is just to listen and identify. So at this point, they don't feel like they're working and struggling with pronunciation. They're just listening and they're trusting in you to show the difference, for now. And when they feel a bit more confident with that, oh, sorry, they, they point to the one that they hear when you, when you model them. When they feel more confident with that, then they do it in pairs so they can test each other. So you go from their receptive awareness to their productive ability, in theory. And usually this is really, really hard, but language learning is really hard, and it draws their attention to something which is immediately useful and necessary, which just arose. It happened to me a few months ago, I had a, um, a student whose first language was Spanish, and he was trying to talk about a, a comma. He was explaining something to his partner, and they missed completely that he was talking about pronunciation and thought he was saying coma. <laughs> Even though context made that completely impossible, they were relying on the sound. And I hadn't anticipated this. I didn't know then that this is a common difficulty for students whose first language is Spanish. And so I put one here, and I put one here, and then we played with them. And it all got very silly and embarrassing, but it was fun, and it, it drew attention to what they needed. So again, this can work for any level. With elementary level, I find this p and b distinction is a problem for some of my students, especially if their first language is Arabic. And so this is my whiteboard, and this is me. And I've written both. And can you have your fingers ready, please? If you hear this one, point this way. And if you hear this one, point this way. And I won't trick you. <laughs> Pie. Bye. Bye. Pie. Pie. Bye. Pie. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And it takes two seconds to write it on the board, but it just comes up in a lesson and sometimes it feels like it needs attention, and there's no way that I could have seen that coming and planned something. And it doesn't require materials. And the reason I've included it in this workshop is because I find it often comes from what they're doing in the course book. And I'm busy thinking about the fact that it's a vocabulary exercise or something. And when they're speaking about it, pronunciation becomes an issue. At another level, uh, this is the example that's on the handout, in a grammar box, the wood. And again, I find students often really struggle with this, I'd never, I never. It's so small and so quick. And they can avoid it by saying, I would never. But especially the ones who come to study in London, they often hear a lot of native speakers using English, and they usually contract it. Okay. So again, <laughs> I'd never work. <laughs> I never work. I never work. I'd never work. And so on. Can you test each other quickly? Find a partner? Do the same thing. Don't be shy. Um, I never work. I never work. I never work. I'd never work. I'd never work. I'd never work. So we've gone from individual sounds 
to individual sounds but a feature of a grammar point. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll point out that the pronunciation wasn't very thorough in this part of the book, but the grammar box is there, so there's something to work from. And then the higher level. I've written advanced. There's really no reason why this needs to be advanced, but I found that it often gets covered at that level. So we've got um, contrastive stress. Mm -hmm. okay. So she's my sister, not my mother, versus she's my sister, not his. Okay. Can you just quickly test each other again? Same principle. Fingers ready. <laughs> Okay, so one thing I didn't mention, but one thing that can make it even sillier and more fun if it's not already, and I remembered because I noticed some ladies doing it at the back, thank you, is it helps to make these things physical. As pronunciation is fundamentally a physical <coughs> process and you're using muscles, and I find sometimes when students can't hear the difference between especially things that are related to stress, getting them to stand up and do it works better. Because they start going, she's my sister, and moving around the classroom. And they feel silly, but it draws their attention to the change in sound and just makes it a bit more engaging. Also, if this is a two-minute activity in the middle of a two-hour lesson, it's a nice reason to stand up for a second and move. And so that brings us to the last thing I'm going to show you, which I call Break It Up. Thank you. And this is turning the, the pronunciation around a little bit and focusing more on the receptive than the productive signs. Um, it's to work on word grouping including pausing and placing nuclear stress, which the last sentence was an example of, for those of you who aren't familiar with the terminology. This idea of moving the, the pitch change from she's my sister to she's my sister, getting students to work on where the stress tends to fall in a group of words, where it's appropriate to pause, and so on. This came up um, the first time I started thinking about this. It was in a business class and my students were preparing um, presentations, and they were really stressed about their pronunciation, and they had it in their head that the best way to sound fluent is to speak really fast without pausing. <laughs> but all the other students were completely lost, and I was lost, and it didn't help, and they didn't seem to <coughs> believe that an effective speaker actually pauses sometimes and doesn't just speak at machine gun speed. So when we were doing a recording, um, doing a listening with a recording from the course book, this speaker actually was quite clear, and he broke up his speech fairly clearly, and they were a little bit weak. It was an upper intermediate business group, but they weren't very strong, they weren't very confident. And this speaker on the CD was a really good example of where I thought they could be if they had a bit more confidence. Straightforward sentences, but broken up nicely and clearer. And to prepare them for their presentation, I thought, well, we can work on this. He was also a non-native speaker, and they were really paranoid about this for some reason. And I thought it was a nice example of how you can be a very effective and clear communicator if your first language is in English. That's fine. So I wanted to exploit this recording a little bit more, as he was a good role model for the students. So what they do is they mark the tape script, basically, where they expect there to be pauses. Not long pauses because the speaker can't remember what he's going to say or he doesn't know the word, but just breaking up his sentence so it's easier for the audience to follow. And then they listen and check. Quite simple. Um, if you want to make it more challenging, they could do it as kind of a dictation. Sort of like a dictogloss, if you know that activity. You listen to it several times, write the words that you hear, 
then listen, every time you listen, you add a little bit more until you have the full text. But there, the object is discovering grammar, and here I like it to be discovering pronunciation. So just depending on the level of challenge you want, you could get them to write what they hear in full before focusing on where it pauses. Up to you. So, we're going to do an example, and I've put the recording script under activity 5 on your mm -hmm. handout. Just take a second to read it. to do before you listen is mark, and the convention is with the forward slash, like this, where you think the speaker might pause. A natural, brief pause. Yeah. There are several, and they are debatable. So wherever you think is a logical place to pause, can you put a slash in the script? Okay, ready to hear it? So I'll play it, and obviously you're checking where you think he pauses. It goes a little bit fast, so I will play it more than once. But after the first time, just take a second to reflect, make any changes you want, maybe compare it, and then I'll play it a second time when you're playing. Okay? But actually, most brands in the world are local brands. Um, most people don't realize that, but that is actually the case. So most brands that you buy in retail stores in global markets are manufactured for local markets. Okay, do you want to hear it again? Ready? But actually, most brands in the world are local brands. Um, most people don't realize that, but that is actually the case. So most brands that you buy in retail stores in global markets are manufactured for local markets. I won't go through everything in detail, and there are some arguments, and was this, was that, that pause was a little bit longer, and maybe that pause was a millisecond shorter. But the idea is just to draw their attention to the fact that it's possible to speak clearly and comfortably and professionally when you break up your speech. It gives the listeners time to think, gives the speaker time to think, and this is something that they can prepare. Again, this was a business class that I used this with, and they did a lot of presentations. So they spent a long time preparing what they were going to say, and it had never occurred to them to really prepare how they were going to say it. Pronunciation was always the last thing they thought of preparing. And I'm aware that this chunk of this listening, the speaker does go a little bit slowly, maybe slightly unnaturally, but again, it was a good example that the whole recording, which I don't have time to play, 
was a good example of a very fluent, very competent, non-native speaker, who was a good example for the students. And we just focused on a very, very short section. So, that's the last activity. The table at the bottom of the handout, which we haven't looked at, some of you arrived late, but that was what I was explaining at the beginning, which I used for needs analysis for students. I also have a handout with brief examples of the activities that we did here, which I'll leave on the table. And the slides and a description I'm also going to post on my blog, and there's a link somewhere here. So if you want to find them again later and find the examples, then you can in your own time. So that's all. Thank you very much. We have two minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Where are you from? <laughs> that's the hardest question you could have asked me in two minutes. <laughs> I was born in the States, but I left when I was 11, and I've moved a lot. So I'm, I'm from nowhere. <laughs> or everywhere. Everywhere. Or Mars. <laughs> Any other questions about pronunciation? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I'm around for the whole weekend, so if you think of anything later, I'm always happy to talk about pronunciation. So just keep Thank you. Thank you.